Good evening, everyone. We begin the readout tonight with the people of New York versus Donald Trump. Today was an historic day in lower Manhattan as America learned the full extent of the allegations against the former president. And we got a look at criminal defendant Trump in photos that will live in infamy. The first American president to be charged with a crime, defendant Donald J. Trump, is seen here surrounded by his legal team, a photo Trump most certainly did not want you to see. It's nothing short of a remarkable image of the new reality for the man who raged in all caps on social media ahead of his day in court before surrendering for arrest and processing in Manhattan criminal court. Trump was uncharacteristically grim and silent while entering the courtroom, ignoring questions from reporters before pleading not guilty to 34 felony counts of falsifying business records in the first degree. The now unsealed indictment lays out the 34 counts in the form of numerous entries made with, quote, intent to defraud and intent to commit another crime and aid and conceal the commission thereof. The indictment isn't explicit about those other crimes that Trump tried to conceal, but it is laid out clearly in the prosecutor's statement of facts as a scheme involving Trump and America Media Incorporated CEO David Pecker, noting that in June 2015, Defendant Trump announced his candidacy for president and soon after, in August 2015, met with lawyer A, Michael Cohen and Pecker at Trump Tower. At that meeting, Pecker agreed to help with the defendant's campaign, saying that he would act as the eyes and ears of the campaign by looking out for negative stories about the defendant and alerting lawyer A, Cohen, before the stories were published. The AMI CEO also agreed to publish negative stories about the defendant's competitors for the election. The broader scheme played out in three parts. First, a payoff to a Trump Tower doorman, alleging in November 2015, the AMI CEO learned that a former Trump Tower doorman was trying to sell information regarding a child that the defendant had allegedly fathered out of wedlock. At the CEO's direction, AMI negotiated and signed an agreement to pay the doorman $30,000 to acquire exclusive rights to the story. The second part, suppressing woman one, presumably Playboy playmate Karen McDougal. Quote, the defendant, the AMI CEO and lawyer A, had a series of discussions about who should pay off woman one to secure her silence. AMI ultimately paid $150,000 to woman one in exchange for her agreement not to speak out about the alleged sexual relationship. Prosecutors say, quote, the defendant did not want this information to become public because he was concerned about the effect it could have on his candidacy. In other words, it was clearly intended to influence the 2016 election. Then there's the third part, the hush money payment to buy Stormy Daniels silence after the release of the Access Hollywood tape in October 2016. Quote, with pressure mounting and the election approaching, the defendant agreed to the payoff and directed Cohen to proceed. Cohen discussed the deal with the defendant and Trump Organization CFO Alan Weisselberg. The defendant Trump defendant Trump did not want to make the one hundred and thirty thousand dollar payment himself and asked Cohen and Weisselberg to find a way to make the payment. The final part of the scheme, prosecutors say Trump arranged to reimburse Cohen for the payoff that he made on Trump's behalf, saying Cohen submitted 10 similar monthly invoices by email to the Trump organization for the remaining months in 2017. Each invoice falsely stated that it was being submitted pursuant to the retainer agreement and falsely requested payment for services rendered for a month of 2017. Well, in fact, there was no such retainer agreement. And lawyer A, Cohen, was not being paid for services rendered in any month of 2017. After the twice impeached former president's arraignment, Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg addressed reporters about the importance of pursuing the case against Trump. Under New York state law, it is a felony to falsify business records with intent to defraud and an intent to conceal another crime. That is exactly what this case is about. 34 false statements made to cover up other crimes. These are felony crimes in New York State, no matter who you are. 
we cannot and will not normalize serious criminal conduct. We have a distinct and strong, I would say profound, independent interest in New York State. This is the business capital of the world. Uh, we regularly uh, do cases involving false business statements. For Trump, the ultimate indignity is that he got away with the Access Hollywood tape politically, but he will now have to pay for it legally at the hands of Manhattan prosecutors and the people of the state of New York. Joining me now is Hugo Lowell, political investigations reporter for The Guardian, who was in the courtroom today for Trump's arraignment. Katie Fang, attorney and host of The Katie Fang Show on MSNBC. And Charles Coleman Jr., former Brooklyn prosecutor, civil rights attorney, and MSNBC legal analyst. Thank you all for being here, Hugo. Uh, I, I, I am very excited to hear from you. Please talk about the atmosphere in the court today, what you saw, uh, and specifically what you observed about Donald Trump today. It was extremely tense. Uh, when we got to the courtroom, there was probably about 20 court security officers, probably around five to 10 Secret Service officers, and we were waiting for a while. And first the uh, prosecution team walked in, and then Trump's defense counsel walked in, and then Trump walked in. And when Trump came into the courtroom, he looked particularly angry, visibly shaken, and the most gaunt that I've seen him. And it was, it was really striking. I've never seen him look so, uh, I guess, afraid. And I've never seen him look so serious uh, as he did today. And it was striking how all of this was on his face, even as he showed no discernible emotion throughout proceedings. And I think principally it was the result of him walking into the courtroom, being read the criminal charges, and that actually hitting him. You know, we spoke to advisors when he learned about the indictment, and he, he was kind of hit then. But when he actually walked into the courtroom, I think he was hit to a whole new degree, and the gravity of the moment really sunk in. And just to, to stay with you for a moment, Hugo, I mean, you have covered Donald Trump. You've covered him at, at uh, Trump Tower. You've covered him at Mar-a-Lago. Uh, what you're describing is a very different Donald Trump than the one that, you know, people who watched The Apprentice or watched him as president experienced. You know, this is a man who is excellent at uh, being performative, about being the star of his own show. And he has been talking for weeks about how he wanted to be the star of his own show this time, too. You know, he was talking about how he wanted to be handcuffed and, oh, you know, with all this bravado about how he wanted his hand specifically behind his back and should I smile for the cameras and, you know, I want to be a martyr. But when it actually came to the moment, he was really drawn. He was really gaunt. Uh, and there was none of the performative stuff that you saw kind of in the lead up to this arraignment. Once he made his way into the courtroom where there were no TV cameras and there were only the photographers at the start, that was the tone that he set and that was the demeanor that he had. And I've never seen anything like it. Uh, let, me, let me come to the table for a moment, because, you know, back to attorneys here, you know, it's like when they say in boxing, you, you really don't know anything until you get punched in the face. Mm -hmm. Then you really find out which God you serve. Right. You find things out. And I mean, Donald Trump has for his entire life had someone fixing things for him. He always had a fixer. He and always in, wanted a Roy Cohn, right? He had a Roy Cohn. Yep. He had Michael Cohen. He had Alan Weisselberg. He's always had someone to fix it. So even for Donald Trump, who's gotten away arguably with committing a few crimes in his time over the course of his life, think, suddenly it's different when you're in court. Think about it this way, Joy. You're talking about someone who went through a Mueller investigation. Nothing happened. You went through an impeachment number one, nothing happened. You went through impeachment number two, nothing happened. All of these formal proceedings that have taken place have not led to any actual consequence. But during each of those, you still had the status to be in control of the institutions that were investigating you. You still had a certain level of power over the people who were making the decisions. Now you are not in that arena anymore. You are in an arena where you have no control. You can't control the narrative. You can't control the actors and you can't control the system. And so those are new things for Donald Trump to experience. And the fact that he is a litigant in myriad civil cases has nothing to do with this because because this is a space where you will lose your freedom. Yeah. And that's something that he hasn't experienced before. Ever before. I mean, there was the, all the talk of him putting out like a fake version of the mugshot that they could sell on T-shirts. I mean, it, it gets real when it's a real mugshot. I Donald Trump has been railing about how unfairly the justice system is supposedly treating him. When in reality, that treatment 
is actually pretty cushy compared to how people of color have been treated by the justice system for decades. At today's arraignment, Trump was not in handcuffs or leg shackles. He didn't have a mugshot taken. He didn't even have to sit in a holding cell. That is nowhere near the worst of what the criminal justice system has to offer. A prime example of what inhumane treatment does look like is a case Donald Trump is quite familiar with, involving the now exonerated Central Park Five, who were wrongfully convicted of the rape of a white jogger more than 30 years ago. You will remember Trump took out a full-page ad in four major New York City newspapers calling for the state to adopt the death penalty and use it on the teens, something he has never apologized for. Mr. President, will you apologize to the Central Park Five? They've been exonerated. You have people on both sides of that. They admitted their guilt. If you look at Linda Fairstein and if you look at some of the prosecutors, uh, they think that the city should never have settled that case. So we'll leave it at that. Joining me now is Yusuf Salam, one of the exonerated five, candidate for New York City Council and author of Better Not Bitter, The Power of Hope and Living on Purpose. It's so great to see you. Thank you for having me. So I have to tell you, I'm a couple years older than you, and I had just moved back to New York when um, the your case began and watched it every day and was severely traumatized mm -hmm. by it. Um, not anywhere close, obviously, to you guys. But I was a teenager, too. And what that case told me was that it was not safe to be a black teenager in New York. I was terrified as a result of that. And everyone I knew was, too. Um, and so I just, you know, very, very curious as to how it felt for you in particular having been through what you were and having that man want you dead, want you to be killed by the state of New York, to watch him have to face the criminal justice system today. How did you feel? You know, 34 years ago, I wasn't afforded the presumption of innocence. They looked at the color of my skin and judged me by it. They never looked at the content of my character. In America, they say that you're innocent until proven guilty, but rather for the black and brown community, they look at you and say, you are guilty, guilty, guilty. And I look at what happened today and... It was a moment for me. It was a moment because here we are on the cusp of, can I go from calling it the criminal system of injustice, which everyone knows me as calling it, back to calling it the criminal justice system? This moment is a moment, I'm sure, when I think about Dr. King. You know, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. I get the opportunity to be front and center with all of my lived experiences and it's a bittersweet moment, though, at yeah. the same time. You know, it's, 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 you know, when I think about the rhetoric that's out there, when Donald Trump says, you know, if they could do this to me, you know, none of us are safe. Come on. We live in two different worlds. And yeah. of course, people take my words and they bend it and try to attribute it to other people and other groups. And no, I'm talking about Donald Trump and I'm talking about the people who use privilege as a weapon. And for me, as a member of the black and brown community, and hopefully as a representative of our community, I know far too well all of the lows that we've been in, all of the places that we've been pushed into, the margins of life. And now here we are at the opportunity to say, well, we're supposed to be living. In fact, we're supposed to be thriving. God gave us a birthright to say, we are supposed to be here, and therefore here we are. Yeah. I mean, and the, the fact that, you know, he talked about Linda Fairstein, I mean, this is mm. the irony and sort of the karmic irony that it is a black DA that Donald Trump has to face. Um, and that he is getting the full, you know, he's being afforded all of the full protections of the law is, is something. But I, I, I have to talk about this because you are running um, for District I. This is the map. It's too small for me to really read it. I'm going to have to squint and look at it. Um, but you took the, the thing that had to have been one of the most painful things in your life. We're going to put it on screen, but this is it. I'm holding it in my hand. This is your ad yes. that you have created. There it is on screen that mimics the ad he created that called for your death. Oh, yeah. And you've turned it into a campaign ad Absolutely. for your campaign. Why? Absolutely. You know, people need hope. They don't necessarily need to just look at my story and say, wow, great move. No, they need to understand we absolutely can resuscitate our lives. When you look at the Harlems of the world and you walk around and you see what? You see hopelessness. You see sleeping giants. You see people who have said, you know what? I don't even want to participate. But they don't realize yet that non-participation is participation. I heard Eric Thomas say, you have to recycle the pain. You know, you're gonna go through things in life. Might as well get something out of it. Here I get the opportunity to take all of the things that I've lived through, and rather just going through it, I grow through it. 
And I think that I, with the light that I have been given, can shine the way forward. That's why I'm running for city council. Yeah. yeah. When is the race? The race is June 27th. Okay. I'm excited. Yeah. Folks are, you know, it's, it, for me, it's not politics as usual, right? Yeah. It's not business as usual. This is my first entry into the political sphere. Yeah. But at the same time, I've been watching. I've been gathering information. I've understood the people who have been closest to the pain. Why? Because I've been in pain. Mm -hmm. And now we have to have a seat at the table. So it's no longer enough for us to march, at, in, in, march in the streets for justice. Yeah. We now have to have someone who is advocating for us in the halls of power that can ensure that their voices are carried and echoed and echoed and echoed. Uh, I, I um, am amazed by you, um, by your grace, um, your ability to survive and thrive. I wish you all the best. Harlem would be so lucky. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Yusuf Salam, I'm gonna give you your honorific too. Dr. Yusuf Salam, God bless. Thank you.